Dr. Rhonda Patrick, what is possibly worse than smoking when it comes down to life expectancy? Yeah, I, it, it, this, it's funny because we were talking about this um, a moment ago and it's, it's, it, it sort of blew my mind to see some data. This is out of Bill Harris's group um, that looked at life expectancy and the omega-3 index, which is a really good way of measuring your omega-3 levels. Everybody knows smoking is bad for you, right? I mean, that's like common knowledge. Everybody knows that. However, when you look at life expectancy and you sort of stratify, stratify the data according to smokers and non-smokers, smokers with a high omega-3 index, in other words, they have high levels of omega-3, have the same life expectancy as non-smokers with low omega-3. And if you look at the data, there's this beautiful graph. The, curve, the life expectancy curves overlay where those two are the same. And it's just kind of mind blowing because not getting enough omega-3, not having a high omega-3 index was as bad as smoking with respect to life expectancy. Now, a lot of people, when they think about smoking being bad, they think about, oh, cancer. Smoking increases cancer and lung cancer, you know. But that takes sort of decades to accumulate the kind of damage you need, you know, to, to increase that risk of cancer. It's, it's your cardiovascular health that's at high risk with smoking. And it's not a linear risk like cancer is. Like the more, you, the more packs you get you know, under your belt, the more packs of cigarettes you get on your belt, the higher the cancer risk. But with risk of heart attack, risk of um, cardiovascular disease, it doesn't take as much. So it's, it's one of those things where um, smoking really negatively, negatively affects cardiovascular health and that's the actual thing that omega-3s are very beneficial for. So um, it, it, it's just kind of a mind-blowing way to think about, because it, I think this came out back in like 2009. It was a study out of Harvard. And I remember reading this study and the headline was top six preventable causes of death. And these are things like, okay, not smoking. That's a top preventable cause of death, right? Early death, early mortality, um, hypertension, right? So avoiding hypertension. Those things were obvious, but what, what was up there was low omega-3 from marine sources. In other words, from fish, right? So there's omega-3, there's DHA, EPA, those are from marine sources. And then there's ALA from plant sources. And it was from the fish that was identified as one of the top preventable causes of death. And I, that was very intriguing because it's like, oh, you know, that's a, that's an easy, um, nutritional, most people kind of think of things to avoid things to get cut out. Um, but what you're not getting is I like to focus on that. You know, what, what are you not getting in your diet? And, um, scientists from Harvard had attributed about 84,000 deaths a year to not getting enough omega-3. In other words, people that were having that low omega-3 index predominantly from affecting cardiovascular related mortality. Right. Um, but it, what was also interesting was that the same number of deaths were attributed, so about 82,000 deaths a year, were attributed to eating trans fats. <laughs> Again, everybody knows trans fats are not good for you, right? I mean, it's on every grocery shelf, like, you know, that you, you walk into, it's like zero trans fat, zero trans fat, right? You buy a bottle of water, it's like zero trans fat, right? But, but no one's thinking about that when they go into the grocery store, oh, am I getting my fish today? Am I getting my omega-3 today? Because the same amount of deaths were attributed to not getting enough of that as for getting trans fats. So again, right? It's just a way of thinking about it where, and, and this is just like scratching the surface, you know? So there's just been so much data. A lot of um, data have come, have come out of Bill Harris's group, by the way. Um, he, he now has a, a great research institute, the Fatty Acid Research Institute, which I'm an associate researcher. Um, part of that institute where we study a variety of different fatty acids, predominantly omega-3, and their effects on human health. And um, Bill's done a lot of great work. You know, he is the co-inventor of the omega-3 index. And I like this because it's a, a biomarker of long-term omega-3 status. Um, in other words, instead of looking at plasma phospholipids, where it's like, oh, what did I eat in the last week? Did I eat fish? Um, you know, that, that's sort of reflective of more of like your recent diet. Whereas if you get and you measure omega-3 in your red blood cell membranes, those have a lifespan of roughly, I don't know, it's like 120 days or something like that. So you're talking about a longer term omega-3 status, right? Very similar to like HbA1c versus fasting blood glucose. 
that was know. that was going to be my question was like how long would it take someone to change their omega-3 index like if they were if i had never consumed fatty fish i wasn't taking an omega-3 supplement nothing like that and i started today is it one of those things like you see a pretty quick increase or is it as you're mentioning is sort of a lagging indicator where it's like okay take it for three months then we have to kind of go back and retroactively measure but then also as far as a benefit is concerned like or risk like if someone were to have a low omega omega-3 profile or index and they had that for three months is that potentially equivalent to three months of smoking how does it equivalent or how is it equivalent in terms of a time scale well to address your first question it takes i would say about three months like about three months is a good time range like let's say you're now deciding i'm going to increase my omega-3 intake through supplementation through um maybe increasing sources of you know high um, epa and dha like fatty fish um wild alaskan salmon you would, you would wait about three months, again, because it takes about that long for your red blood cells to turn over. So you have to wait that long before you can get an omega-3 index test done. And, um, you know, the question is, well, omega-3 index, why do you want it to be higher? Well, I mentioned the smoking, right? When I say higher, most of the studies are like 8% omega-3 index or more. And when I say low omega-3 index, most studies are 4% or lower. Um, average omega-3 index in, in the United States is about four to five percent so we're really low compare that to japan they're like 10 or 11 percent omega-3 index the average japanese person on average has a five-year increased life expectancy compared to the average american now um, bill harris has done some some research looking at um huge pop you know huge uh, sample sizes looking at the omega-3 index and life expectancy and people that have the eight percent omega-3 index or higher have a five-year increased life expectancy compared to people with the low omega-3 index of 4%. Now, how long does it, you know, how much omega-3 would it take to go from 4% to 8%, right? Um, obviously, there's individual variation. There's, a, you know, omega-3s are a, you know, compound that it, 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 we make in our bodies from ALA. We also have to get ALA from our diet to make them, but we have a lot of gene variations that regulate the way we metabolize it. With that said, on average, it takes people about two grams of omega-3 a day to go from a 4% to an 8%, and those studies have been done. Um, so whether or not your omega-3 index is low for three months, and then you go up to, you know, from 4% Four percent to eight percent, like we don't like we don't know what effect that has, right? Like you're asking a very complicated question in terms of like, you know, time kinetics and um, you know, oh, I was low omega three during development and through my early adult life, but then I, you know, at some point we then go to randomized controlled trials, yeah. and that's where go, you know we still we also have data where it's like okay, people that are at high risk for let's say myocardial infarction, so heart attack, or people that have existing um, cardiovascular disease, they're taking you know, pharmaceuticals like statins, for example, to treat it. Um, a lot of studies have, have taken these populations of people that presumably um, do not take omega-3. Unfortunately, studies don't often measure the omega-3 index at the start of a trial. I wish they did. They don't. Um, it costs more money, and there's that's like the age-old problem with randomized controlled trials is not measuring measuring nutrient levels in a person before the trial starts. I think it really it's it's one of my 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 pet peeves because um, you know we have different gene variations that regulate the way our body metabolizes nutrients. Right? It's not like a drug. You don't have to measure someone's baseline levels of let's say a statin that you're going to give them at the start of a trial because nobody has statins. <laughs> at the start of a trial. But people have different, you know, intakes of fish. They have different genes that regulate how much, let's say they take, eat a lot of walnuts or flax seeds, which are high in ALA, um, the plant omega-3, that makes them either convert it well or not well. Like, you know, there's there's reasons why we need to, to measure these, you know, nutrients at the start of a trial. Anyways, not done, but we do know, for example, there's been um, the Reduce It trial. That was the big trial that was, that looked at um, people with existing cardiovascular disease. And it was a five-year trial where people were given a high dose of purified EPA. So it was just one of the omega-3s and it was in an ethyl ester form, which we can talk about. It's not very bioavailable. 
and um, or a placebo. In this case, the placebo was mineral oil, and there's all sorts of controversy over that being actually pharmacologically active and not being a great placebo. Regardless, um, after the five years, people taking the EPA, it was called it's called Vizipa. It's a pharmaceutical um, prescriptive form of omega three that people are given, for example, with high triglycerides or with existing cardiovascular disease. Um, those people had a 25% decrease in heart attack or death, actually it was death from heart attack and death from heart disease compared to placebo. So that was quite robust. Um, and regardless of all the arguments, well, the placebo was, you know, maybe the placebo was actively harmful. Even if you just look at the baseline risk reduction, it was very significant. So, and it was reducing triglycerides. You know, there was effects independent of looking and comparing to placebo group that were like, wow, this is unbelievable. It's taking, like you were saying, it's taking this unhealthy group of people, giving them simply just a form of omega-3 over the course of several years. And it's like dramatically lowering their risk of dying from a heart attack, which is the number one killer in the United States. 